Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. This is episode number 193. Um, I just went out and looked on the YouTube channel and realized I had been misnumbering the past several webinars and kind of sticking at 190 for a while, but we have moved beyond that. Um, I was trying to get a special guest for 200. I, that may work out. I'm not sure if the timing's quite right, but I think I have a pretty exciting webinar coming up next week that you're all really going to enjoy. And that's really, really important information. So stay tuned. If you do not subscribe to the email at murdochmethod.com, then you will not get the Sunday email that has all the webinars for the week. So go to murdochmethod.com, join my email list, and every Sunday I put out a newsletter that tells you who the guests are for the upcoming week. On Tuesday this week, we're not gonna have you sign in through the store. We're gonna give you the link directly because we're gonna be with Callie King and talking about my Effortless Rider course, which is open right now. So if you have not gone to horseclass.com and signed up for my free workshop, now's the time because it will close. So it's not there forever. Um, so get over there soon, next day or two and um, go through those uh, lessons that we have up there. People love them. They're some of my favorites. I, I just think they're really fun and they're kind of mind blowing um, if you haven't done them before or heard about Feldenkrais method. So uh, go do that. Um, and then this week we did something so different. We did live from the barn. Um, and I don't know how many of you watching uh, tuned in that day. We had a little technical glitch on the webinar link. Sadly, the webinar was, we both, Alex and I missed it. It was signed up at nine o'clock in the morning instead of one o'clock, which was the real time. Um, so we did try to send out a link to everybody and get them in. We did have almost 30 people watch live from the barn and we had to move it to the other end because the Wi-Fi wasn't good where we set up, which was a shame because it's a little bit easier at the other end. But nonetheless, Daisy trimmed the kid who's been a, she's a laminitic horse um, live. And Kimmy, her assistant, did an amazing job of getting down on the floor to get the photos. And you know what? I'm just going to show you. I'll put up a, um, and I had radiographs of the horse from this month when the vet came and did our annual radiographs on everybody. So it was just really, really fun to be able to put all of that together. Um, so let me just show you a couple of the pictures from the, well, I'll start here. Um, just so you kind of see what we were up to in the barn on Wednesday. So um, here's Daisy. <laughs> Before we got started, she took a little nap um, with Joyce's dog, Millie. Um, so she was chilling. And this is where we set up first. So we were toward the east end of the barn and we had the lights up and everything organized. And then we found out the Wi-Fi wasn't good enough. So we switched to the other end of the barn. This is now the west end of the barn. And here's Kimmy on the floor and here's Daisy um, working with the kid. And I had Steve Macklin there to help and Brad's in the background. So we had um, just, uh, uh, just the right number of people. I have to say, given the barn aisle size and everything, we had just the right number of people so we could spell each other off. Um, and Daisy hoof mapped that foot and um, did her little pink lines. And you can see this one's been trimmed. And this is, this is all the foot growth growing out here that she um, took away so that she didn't have the leverage or kind of smoothed in to reduce the leverage. So we took pictures. So that webinar, it's like an hour and a half. Um, and it was great. Uh, um, Daisy was actually at my place until eight o'clock that night because she did um, the other horse and then we, uh, put some gluons on Al, um, but I just thought it was just really great. It worked out fantastic. Um, there's both feet trimmed and uh, we walked her up and down the barn aisle. And by the way, um, this is Daisy's physio pad. It's, um, she's had it, it's a prototype. It doesn't even have the logo on it. That's how early on. So this is 2017. This would have been January 2017. So this pad's four years old and she uses it every day. And that's what it looks like after four years. Um, and we did something really special for Daisy. Um, I asked my manufacturer to make a series of pink 
full physio pads and some half physio pads. And the shipment just arrived yesterday. So um, I do have pink, it's special. I gotta talk to Daisy and see what we're gonna do with them, whether they're gonna go through her. These all have a logo, they have the new logo on it. So I'm really excited about that. So, um, but if you've been dying for a pink full physio or half physio pad, just know that there is a chance that you could get one of these special orders. I don't do things like that very often because it kind of upsets the factory when you kind of throw in a, a wrench. Um, but when I remembered that we had given her a pink one, which I'd forgotten. Um, and of course, Daisy's favorite color is pink. So we did that for Daisy. Okay, so um, this week I got a question about how did I come up with the different density pads? And I realized I don't think I've ever talked about that. So that's what I thought we'd talk about today is um, how did we come up with the product line that we have? And so for any of you tuning in for the first time or who hasn't um, done a lot of research on Surefoot or kind of read some of the story, why don't I kind of back up a little bit and just bring you all forward. So in May of 2012, so it's going to be 11 years, which is um, amazing because I kept thinking it was eight, but it'll be 11 years May. I had a horse that was lame in the right hind leg, a student, knew the horse well, had been working with them for three years. She had changed the saddle to a jumping saddle on this horse. That jumping saddle was twisted. It put pressure on the back right quarter of his back. Um, he was short, the farrier quicked him. I'm sure because he was sore and uncomfortable on that same foot. So he was laid up a little while and then he was back under saddle and she came for a lesson. And at that time I was teaching at Morvin Park in Leesburg, Virginia. And I would go once a month, I'd go up on Monday and then go back on Tuesday. So I'd see, be there two days in a row, once a month. The previous month, the horse was fine. Um, and when I got there, it was obvious he was short in the right hind leg. We switched back to her dressage saddle that she had in the trailer, he was still short. So I went home that night and I was talking to Dr. Joyce Harmon, which is the barn that I just showed you where we did the filming with Daisy. That's Dr. Harmon's place. That's where my horse lives. Um, and I was talking to Joyce and she wanted to stand at her computer instead of sit. And so you think of 11 years ago, this whole idea of Veridesks or standing desks didn't really exist. Um, the idea was just starting to come in. And so she had someone build her a stand for her laptop and she wanted a pad to stand on. So while we were talking, she told me about how they were using different um, types of air-filled items for dogs for rehab. And so I was tapping away on my laptop while I'm talking to her on the phone and I'm seeing these dogs on all these different unstable surfaces. And I said to her, do you think this would work for a horse? And she said, I don't know, but time it for 15 seconds. Now she knew Dante, he had been a client of hers, so I told her about him a bit. And um, the next day I drove to the lesson with something I grabbed out of my shed. I picked up his foot, I stuck it underneath, I put his foot down, timed it for 15 seconds. He walks off completely different. Mind blowing, <laughs> just truly mind blowing. Um, life changing uh, because now where I am, it's really amazing that uh, that all started um, 11 years ago. And so at the time, um, since I created an entire category, I mean, this whole idea of uh, working through the hoof, it just didn't exist. Um, nobody was doing anything like this. Uh, you know, there were a few farriers out there randomly putting something underneath the horse's foot to make them a little more comfortable, but there was no concept that this could make permanent changes, behavior, movement, um, performance. And when I watched this horse, cause we were working under saddle and I watched the changes and as a riding instructor, you know, it just struck me instantly that I was looking at a paradigm shift. I was watching something that would completely change the way we think about horses and think about their feet. Now, of course there's the old adage, no hoof, no horse. Um, and we understand that in terms of the health of the foot if it's an unhealthy foot, the horse is lame or sore, he's not functional. But we weren't thinking about the foot as a sensory organ through which we could input information. We were just thinking, you know, it needs to be 
well, balanced, even that's changed a lot in the past 11 years, what good balance is. There's so much more science coming in on that now. Um, but we understood, you know, if the horse was sore footed, he couldn't do his job. So this idea that the foot is a sensory organ and that we can allow the horse to experience and become aware, in other words, to be self-correcting, to become self-aware and self-correcting means we have to acknowledge the horse is a sentient being that has thoughts, that has feelings, that has emotions. Are they like a person? No, because they don't have a frontal lobe the way we do. But all animals, I mean, if you have a cat or a dog, you can see sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're grumpy, sometimes they're nervous, you know, so we recognize emotions. But we, we really hadn't thought, at least as far as my experience, that if we provided the right opportunity, the horse would actually change on his own that we just have to set up the environment for change in a way that is meaningful to the horse so that he can have a self-aware experience that provides him with an option. And given that option, he can then choose what's best. And this is where, you know, when we see horses stand on surefoot pads and see them experiment, Sometimes they step off. Sometimes, you know, they don't need a lot of information. Sometimes they need a ton of information. Sometimes they want lots of pads. Sometimes they don't want any pads, but they engage with us and show us what they want because we allow them to. I approach it as, would you like this? This is an offer. You know, if I come up to you and say, hey, would you like an ice cream? And you're going to go, yeah. But if you're lactose intolerant, you're going to go, I don't know. You know, do you have any non-dairy? And if I go, no, then you're like, eh, I can't eat ice cream. So, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's an offer. An offer is you have the opportunity to say no. Um, and so that that's, I, I, in fact, I last Saturday, and I, I didn't post about this, but I probably should, I don't have any photos, I got to ask him. I went to Day's End Farm in Maryland, in Woodbine, Maryland. And Day's End is an equine rescue where they work with the uh, authorities. And if they have to go in and impound horses or, you know, uh, shut, shut a place down due to abuses or whatever, the horses come to Day's End. So it's not like a anybody from the public can hand them a horse. It's all through the legal system and the, um, you know, that the, um, I lost the word for it, animal control um, and that sort of thing. So, but they'll get 17 horses in at a whack, you know, and they have anywhere from 70 to 90 horses on their property that can go through there. Um, and their goal is to recover the horse from debilitation to rehab the horse if they can, get it under saddle, and then rehome that horse. And that's their goal. And it's an amazing program that they have there. And Diet Hillman um, did a webinar with me. So if you wanna learn more about Days End, please go and watch that webinar with Diet because she's amazing. Um, and so I went there and they showed me around the place. It's really amazing. And then I worked with her horse and then two of the other horses on the property. Um, and uh, her staff was there. She has two trainers and then there's a veterinarian and they were all there. And they didn't really understand Surefoot. They hadn't really heard about it before. So I started with Diet's horse um, in Appaloosa that has a check ligament injury right now. And so I avoided that leg. But it, he also has something going on in his sacrum. And it became obvious very quickly because he was not comfortable standing on one back foot on the pads. Um, and it also became really obvious with him, A, that it quickly had an effect and B, he could only take a little dose. We maybe worked with him for 10, maybe 15 minutes. Um, so he was immediately responsive, we, but he was already a chill horse. He was a chillaxy kind of horse actually. And so he was very quick to even go deeper. He's, I think he's used to body work. Um, we did the uninjured front leg and the diagonal hind leg and the right hind he wasn't sure about and the left front I avoided. Um, but the next horse they brought me was a mare that they had rehomed and she had come back and she was nervous, a quarter horse, kind of small quarter horsey feet, but um, 
tense, not a horse everybody could handle. Um, the trainer has been working with her and hoping that they can rehome her again. But she came in high headed, tight necked um, and standing really wide in the front. And I started with uh, the physio pad. Again, if I have any question about the horse that I'm going to work with, I start with the physio pad because it's only an inch and a half, it's the lowest profile. Um, and uh, it, it became really obvious really quickly that it meant something important to her. And so I wound up with her on hard pads in front, both front feet. She wasn't swaying at all, so we could leave her there for a while. And again, that's kind of when you start out, you want to start with the most stable, just like you would in a human physical therapy program. You would start out with the most stable and then work to the least stable, which is going to challenge your balance more. So I worked with hard with her and I didn't actually, I don't think I went to farm, I might've once. Um, but the mayor who was very sort of apprehensive and I'm not sure I'm gonna like you and didn't take long, head down relaxing. And they really saw that change and they know that horse. And I think that that was probably the horse that shifted their mindsets. You know, um, Diet's horse was pretty chill but when they saw this horse change, that was powerful. And it was giving her the choice to stand on the pads and, a, and she was jumpy. Like if I kick the pad toward her, she'd jump. And I have a process how I work through that with horses that I'm casually uh, messy. Because if you make it too perfect and something happens, then they haven't had the opportunity to kind of go, oh, that's okay. It's no big deal if it's not perfect. Um, so she really, you could watch them all and they all wanted to stand on all the different pads. So I pulled them all out and they all got a chance as people to stand on them. Um, and then the third horse they brought me was a horse that he'd been a police horse. I, he'd done some other stuff, big, big draft horse. Um, so I had very different horses that they gave me to work with. And he came in and I could feel that this horse had learned how if you took a hold on that lead shank, he would just drag you wherever he wanted. I mean, he's big. He was, you know, probably 17 hands and at least 1,500, 1,800 pounds um, and massive head. And I could just feel it. If I, if I tensed on that lead, he tested. He said, you know, are you going to pull on me? And I was like, no, I'm going to let that line slide. You want to wander over there a little bit? That's fine. Go ahead. Because there's no way I'm going to out muscle a horse like this. He has to work with me and I have to work with him. So that was when we first walked in and then I came over to the pads and I started again with the hard pads, especially because of his size. When you have a really big horse, you got to start with hard because if you start with something too soft, they're just going to blow right through it at first, right? Because they're just going to, they're big, they're heavy. Um, so I started with the hard pad and I think I wound up using the hard slants, I've forgotten now. Um, but what was really, really cool with that horse is that he was like, hey, you know what? This is kind of cool. I, I like this. And you know what? You're, you're kind of cool. <laughs> and for me, that is so much fun because you could tell his first attitude was, oh, there's another person that's going to just try and pull me around and I'm just going to pull back, drag them around. And then by the end, he was like, you want to go? Oh, yeah, I'll go for a walk with you. I'll, uh, yeah, can I stand on the back? And he had a timer. Like, it was very specific. He would stand for a while and walk off. So the first horse didn't stay on long at all. The second horse didn't want to get off. The third horse had a timer and would walk off, you know. And so um, just really different horses, really, really fun. And I think that they have a new appreciation of what Surefoot can do for them in their program. Because all these horses that come in today's end, if they're coming in today's end, they're coming in because life's been really rough, really hard. Um, and so you know, this is something where they can say to the horse, you know, would you like to feel good? Would you like me to give you a pair of bedroom slippers? How would that feel? And the horses so quickly go, whoa, you, you know, really? You're going to do something nice for me? And it's really meaningful to them. You know, it's profound to them when you see the kind of switch that they go through. Um, so I, I'm going to check back in with yet, see how things are going. But to get back to 11 years ago, May, um, I had just grabbed something out of my shed. Um, and I don't even want to talk about what I used 
because there's such a danger in what I used. It was the only thing I had at the time, but um, you know, the only thing we have that's air filled with the horses in the Surefoot lineup are the pods and they are sealed. The air is gonna stay in them and there's no valve. Um, and so, you know, if you, there's always the caution of what's gonna happen if this thing breaks <laughs> under the weight of a horse. That was, um, so in the beginning, I used things that were breakable, very breakable um, and uh, could have created a problem should they break while the horse was standing on them. Um, but in the beginning, it was just an experiment. And you know, what's gonna happen if we try this? The experiment worked. That started the process of trying to figure out what I could use that was safe, that I didn't have to worry about breaking. I didn't worry, have to worry about noises underneath the horse. Um, at when we first started with slants, I was actually in Colorado um, doing a clinic and the husband of my organizer, my hostess, made my first slants and they were wooden um, because I wanted to change angles. And so the, the hard slants and firm slants are three inches at the back end and go down to basically nothing at the front. So it's a ramp. Um, and so he, he made me a pair of wooden ramps, which I drug around for quite a while. Um, but when we went to MSU, which I did go to MSU and we did have a horse on four pla force plates and we did put them on pads and look at their weight distribution. And sadly that data has never been analyzed. So um, what happened while we were there is we had done the front feet and then we put the horse on the wooden ramps on the back feet, but we were on a rubber mat surface, which was the matting over the force plates. And we approached a front leg and as we approached the front leg, she shifted her weight on her back foot and the ramp, which was here, it flipped up and whacked her in the cannon bone, you know, and rightly so she was like, whoa, this is the Arab mayor. Um, and because I'd been working in arena footing, we hadn't had that experience because it would just sink into the arena footing. But here on solid footing, rubber mat surface, when she shifted that weight back, it flipped it up and whacked her in the cannon bone. And so, you know, we got her over that. We, we made amends, um, but it, it became so apparent that, you know, I needed to come up with solutions to this because the angles were really helpful, but you couldn't use something that was gonna be injurious to the horse that might damage the horse. So in 2016, 15, I think we started in 15. It took us basically two years. In 2015, I came home one day and I complained to Brad, my guy, that um, you know the, the items that I was using at that time were uh, made of molded foam. So they, it was something from the human market and it was molded. And the problem with a mold is if you slice the surface, the foam expands. And as it expands, the thing would fall apart. And so literally, like I would use a brand new one on, on day one, the horse would slice the surface and I would be throwing it away at the end of the week because the foam expanded and it just literally would fall apart. So the human products weren't working because of the issues with breakage, the issues with falling apart, the issues with shape. They weren't um, very, friendly to be used with horses in terms of the shape when you're working with hooves versus human feet. Um, and they um, were, you know, they were just falling apart. So Brad um, started calling and he started looking for companies that could help us. And we found a company, found an individual at a company and he understood what we were doing and he said, I can help. Um, they have over 3000 different foams at that company. So then it became the process of elimination. What's going to work? What's going to give me the kind of results that I'm seeing that's going to be comparable in those responses, but that's going to hold up to a horse? And so, um, you know, it would take six months and they'd send me a sample and I'd go out and in five seconds I would discard it. It was either too hard or too soft or not, you know, didn't have the the qualities, the properties that I needed 
to be comparable to what I was doing at the time and give us the response with the horse and be durable. So that was, you know, that's the, always the trade-off is the, the amount of give versus the durability. Um, but I put up a post, if you're not a member of the Fans of Surefoot page on Facebook, please join there. Um, I just put up a post about the firm pads that I, I you know, some people want to try to figure out what wear and tear is and I, and I put up a post, but I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, I wanna keep on this thread of how we came up with these pads. And so we, we got one material and that seemed to be okay, it was working. But then they, I think, um, Brad, didn't they just send us some different materials? How did we ever get the hard? Brad's here, he just walked in. Um, um, how did we get the hard material? I think that was just one of my meetings. Did you go up and find it? Brad went up many times to this company and he would go and wander around in their back rooms, which were piled high with a million different materials, shapes, sizes, colors, densities. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think it was just, just I went up and had a meeting with Tate and we were discussing things. And I'm just, he had a a piece that was thinner, not as thick as what we use now. Oh, that's right. He did have a thin piece. That's right. right. We were starting with, with half inches. And half, we and I think this what he gave me was maybe an inch thick. Yeah. And we started and, laminating them together to get something that was going to be thick enough. So they were sending us thin pieces. And actually, that was the same with the medium. They sent us, it's it was red. They sent us a stack of the medium glued together. Um, and because you know you need a certain thickness because if you if it's too thin the horse is just going to bottom right through it and wind up back on the surface that he's on because they weigh a lot so they were laminating pieces together i have in the shed i have all the prototypes i never oh, threw them away boxes, <laughs> crates of prototypes and um and so we were we were working through their 3,000 different foams. Obviously, some of them we just chucked out right away. And we had this one that was blue. The foam itself was blue. And we thought, oh, this is going to work great. And then we coated it with something black to, to, for the surface. And we I sent it to, Di to somebody at Disney World. And the problem was it didn't work at all. You couldn't damage it, but it didn't work. And so that's, you know, that's the deal is we're... We're working with a horse that weighs a lot, that has shoes, that has bare feet. By the way, bare feet can slice pads, whereas shod feet tend to rip pads. So, you know, if you have a horse, even, even if you have a nice roll, it can slice a little bit. But if you don't have a nice roll on your barefoot horse, if he's due to be trimmed, um, those edges can get super sharp and they can slice the materials. So just so that you know that. Um, but this was the thing is, how do we come up with something that's going to give us the results that we want, that's going to be durable, and that we wanted a graded experience? And what do I mean by a graded experience? If you have ever gone to the physical therapist and had something, a surgery on your foot or something where you had to work on your balance, they start you out on a very stable surface. So if you're challenged with too much of an unstable surface and you don't have the intrinsic muscle tone and you don't have the proprioception and your balance is off, you're gonna be in really serious trouble. So they always start you off with a graded experience of easier to do, meaning less unstable, and then move you into the more unstable surfaces so that you progress. And so this is what we were thinking about is we want a, a nice progression th through different densities so that the horses aren't overfaced. If you're a weak, unbalanced, nervous, anxious horse and you're on medium, it's way too springy. It's gonna make you nervous. It's not gonna work out real well. So we, we came up with the hard material because they were using it for other things. And they said, here, try this one. And the properties of the heart are really fascinating because it'll give to heat and pressure, but there's no lateral instability. And it gives more slowly than the other materials. Now, it is the only one that changes in temperature. If it's colder, it's gonna be harder. And if it's warmer, it's gonna be softer. Um, the other pads don't do that. They don't change, fluctuate with temperature. But um, 
That only means that if your horse stands on it, you want to take a picture of the imprint. If it's warm, warm day, you got to do it quick. If it's a cold day, it'll sit there for a couple of minutes. But that material will return back to its original shape. So um, some people want to call it memory foam. It's not really memory foam, but if that helps you understand it, that's fine. Um, and so, you know, we started messing with that one and found that it was quite fascinating. And so that was a, a more dense material than what I had been using from the human world. So when we plug that into the line, we used to call it impression because it would leave the impression of a hoof. But then I realized nobody knew where it was in the lineup. So we changed it to hard so that if you've ever heard the word impression, that was the hard. Um, so we had hard and then firm. And with the firm, I was trying to match what I was using from the human world. I had two different densities in the human world. So I was trying to come up with something that would be equivalent to that. And so that's why how we got firm and soft. And then they came to us with this other material. Um, like I said, it was laminated up into blocks. Um, the medium and the medium, it's a medical grade foam. It's, um, uh, I don't even know what it's used for in the medical world, but it is a medical grade foam. And it's very springy and its properties are quite different to the others. Um, and so we were like, um, it's, it's squishier than firm, although some people will say that they don't think that, but in our opinion, it's squishier than firm, but not as squishy as soft. So we called it medium um, to put it somewhere in, a, in this progression. So in the original, I had what we would call firm and soft, and I added hard and medium. And then of course I had the wooden slants. And so then we used the firm material to make slants. And the first time we cut them on the wrong bias and that was a kind of not good, but we figured that out really quick. Um, so our first batch was kind of a fail because they cut them on the short instead of the length and uh, nearly killed myself when I stood on it because I slid right off. Um, but that's why we cut them the way we do. And so we started out with firm slants. Um, then of course, one of my people, Brynja in Germany, she's a four hoof. She was like, I really want a slant made out of the hard material. And so we're like, okay, let's see what we can do. Let's see if my factory can do this. And so they created the hard slants. And as soon as they made the hard slants, I fell in love with them. Um, they have, they're the same material as hard. Uh, and so, you know, again, we have hard and firm. Firm has lateral instability. So the firm slants has some lateral instability, whereas the hard and hard slants do not have lateral instability. But you're gonna get that change in angle. And it's gonna, it's gonna maintain that angle more so than the firm, which is gonna give. So, um, and of course with the slants, you can use it, if you have a really nervous horse who's not sure about standing on anything, you could just use the very edge of the slant, which is almost nothing, just to begin giving them an idea of standing on something. And then you can gradually progress further and further up on the slant. At the very back, it's three inches tall. So it's going from basically nothing to three inches. But the horse can be anywhere along that slant. You can also have it um, heel high, heel low, pronated or supinated, right? So I just had those uh, pronation. And if I do it the other way, it would be supination. <laughs> um, so supination is if you take your hand and you make a cup and you're going to eat soup, it's coming into midline, that supination. Pronation is away. That's the easiest way to think about it. Um, so that's how we came up with that basic lineup. And, you know, I have to say that in the beginning we had uh, five. We had hard, firm, medium, soft, and firm slants. And as with almost anything, if someone's given too many choices, they get a little paralyzed in making a decision. Um, you know, if you walk into an ice cream shop and they have 500 flavors, you could get really stuck. If they have five flavors, it's kind of simple. I'm only gonna pick, you know, chocolate and vanilla or butter crunch or Rocky Road. Um, but when, so we knew that in the beginning uh, we had probably one more in our palette than we really needed in terms of making it easy for people to choose. 
but we couldn't decide which one to take out because their properties are so different. Um, and so in the end, we said, well, we're just gonna, we're gonna stay with it because they're all unique in their properties. So again, hard gives to heat and pressure, direct, no lateral instability. Typically it gives slowly, the horses kind of melt. Hard slant, same material, same properties, but now we have an angle. You can use it in the front feet or the back feet. Firm, we start to have lateral instability, right? So it can give in more directions. And uh, firm slant, same property, just on an angle. Medium is springy. It's, it's um, people love it. You know, when people stand on the medium, that's the most favorite pad. Not everybody, but it, the majority of people really like medium. That kind of springiness is kind of lightening, but because it's springy, you have to be careful with a nervous anxious horse because that springiness, especially when they step off, could scare them. Um, I know someone who had a very nervous anxious horse and made the mistake of starting with medium and that didn't work out too good. Um, so I tend not to go to medium until I've kind of gone through the others. And then soft is the most amount of squish. It's the, it's like, melting um, and you're really sore horses and your laminitic horses can really enjoy soft. So, you know, it's like, which one would you pull out of the lineup? Uh, we couldn't decide. So we left them. Um, and then, um, let's see. So that was in 2017. We came out with the first lineup. We added the hard slants, I think at least two years later. Um, and we added the farrier, what we called at the time, what's now the physio pad, we called it the farrier pad. So once we realized that the benefits were there and the durability was there and the product line kind of settled out and we weren't making any changes, um, we started thinking about farriers and how if your horse is sore and, and you know, the farrier is picking up one foot and the other foot sore and the horse isn't comfortable and he's going to mess around and the more he messes around, you know, the more frustrating it becomes for the guy trying to do a good job. Um, and so it's how can we make the horses comfortable, but we didn't want to create instability. So this is where we thought about how can we use the materials that we have to create a pad that's going to provide um, a degree of comfort and give, but not something that's going to cause instability. Now, I have a question here, so let me just read this. Any advice on what pad to use to teach a horse to pick up hooves and get hooves picked up in later? Yeah, that this is what the physio pad is for, Robin. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, Deb, they just received the pads. Is that, uh, yeah, the mail is weird lately. Somebody's sent me something three weeks ago and I still haven't gotten it. Um, and then other times it goes right through. I don't know where it goes when it doesn't. Um, so the physio pad and is the thing to get your horse used to because you can use that while the farrier's trimming or while the barefoot trimmer is trimming or shoeing. And um, let me just find the picture. Let me screen share here. Uh, here's Daisy's uh, physio pad. So the full size is 24 by 16 and it's an inch and a half. It has one inch of the hard material and a half inch of the medium. And the half inch of medium is, um, doesn't have the, the same amount of springiness as the two inch pad. So it has the qualities of it, but because it doesn't have the thickness, it doesn't have that kind of rebound. So here we, we've got a beamer on, on um, kid and we put her front feet on the full physio pad. And as you can see, very comfortable standing there with their two front feet on the pad. Um, this one, the half inch is actually white. That's how old it is. When we first started, we were just using a white material. It's now gray. Um, and Daisy's able to work. And sh this is a horse that when I do her back feet, I, I struggle um, because she's uncomfortable and I'm slow. Um, and it's my, my inability to be quick. So what we came up with is Daisy said, well, how about using the grinder? So um, I'm, she showed me, she did on the video, how to use a grinder. Um, 
and uh, she came to the front and checked and made sure the kid was fine with it. As you can see, she offered it. And of course, this horse, I've clipped this horse and she, she's 24, she's been around the block. Um, so she was totally cool, but that made it so much quicker um, to do her back feet. And also I was taking her a little bit too far away and Daisy being more fit and strong and used to doing this could put her leg where she wanted it. Whereas that was really my slowness and my inability to be able to stay with her, with her leg where she wanted it. Um, but this is what Daisy showed me. It's one of the reasons we had her come and the combination of the Beamer with the full physio pad did the trick um, with really kind of following where she wanted to put her foot. And you can see that's, oops, I guess that's the only one, just way more toward midline. And I was using a hoof jack, to, thinking I was making her more comfortable like getting her something to rest on, but I think I had a little too high. You know, this is why we were here to learn. Um, but you can see that the kid was like totally chill with this whole idea, thought this was great. And of course, Daisy's pink physio pad to go with her um, pink everything. And you can see, I mean, this is this pad's five years old. There's a little bit of damage here, but you look at that. It's like in great shape. So um, the physio pad is the way to go. And uh, okay, so... Um, Somebody's asking, let's see, okay, I need to buy one of the two. Um, so the physio pad comes in full, which is that size where you can put two feet on it or half, which is 16 by 12. Um, and you can get two half pads and you can do a front and a back. If you have a full pad, you can only do a single foot or both front and both back. So it's kind of up to you how flexible you want to be. Um, a pad with left hind degenerative suspensory disease. So this is where Rhonda, I tell you, you know, talk to your vet and, and talk to the veterinarian that Amy Lassat's working with, because I think that, you know, this is where it's kind of getting into treatment. And since I'm not a veterinarian, I can't offer you a treatment plan. Um, and I think she would probably have more experience. I just don't have the experience um, with things like um, degenerative suspensory disease, BD, DS, LD. Um, but I would certainly be doing the other legs um, and can set, tell you to do that. Um, and if I were to use slants, it would be toe down, heel high. Um, although, you know, <laughs> just yesterday, um, somebody put up a photo of a horse that had pods and a pad and she smooshed it around until she got the pod under the pad and then stood on the pad on top of the pod was really happy. So, you know, if you give the horses a chance to kind of mess around with it, they're gonna um, maybe show you what they want. Um, but that's that's how we came up with the physio pad. It was really, our whole goal with that was to make horses more comfortable. Now, what are the benefits of that pad? It's why we renamed it. So we started out with it for farriers and then we had physical therapists over in, in Germany that started using the pad during their treatments. So they put the horse on the physio pad. The full physio is all we had at the time. We didn't have half physios until Brynja said, can you make half of this? <laughs> so Brynja's responsible for two different products. Um, and so um, they will put horses on the full physio and then do treatments, something called NeuroStim or other treatments. And because it's a more, it's a stable surface with great comfort. Um, you can do other treatments while the horse is on that pad. Now, when I had surgery is it three years ago now, um, so if this is your hip joint and this is your greater trochanter, I had formed a bone spur. And so I thought that was the only problem. And when they got in, they found out that my glute medius muscle, your middle glute, only had 25% of the tendon attached onto the greater trochanter. So they put in two screws and they stitched up into the tendon and they reattached glute medius. Well, when I got home, I couldn't stand on my left leg. And three weeks later, I still couldn't stand on my left leg after the physical therapist would come to see me and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I was supposed to leave for Costa Rica to teach a retreat, which I actually did do. Um, but as I was preparing for that, I grabbed my pads and I washed them. 
And as I was washing them, soap and water is all you need. Uh, I was like, you know, this physio pad, I wonder if this would help me. So I put it on the floor in the kitchen and I stood on the physio pad and I could stand without holding on to anything for 15 seconds. And I'd step off and I could not stand on that leg at all without holding on. And I'd step back on the pad, no hands, I'd step off not possible. And I did that. And so I took the pad with me and I, I think I actually took two and I kept one in my room and every day I got up and I stood on that pad. So from personal experience, it, it allowed me to stabilize and find the alignment I needed to stand on my left leg, which I absolutely couldn't do on a solid surface, like a floor or even a carpet. Um, and to this day, I'm not even sure how the, it made that kind of difference. I mean, that's the problem. We don't totally understand how all this happens. Um, but it was, I mean, from that personal experience, it was, it was so powerful that it's like, wow, now I know what this thing's doing for the horses. So when you're working with a, a horse while you're trimming or showing them, if that other foot isn't feeling secure, because you're you've taken away 25% and say just one other foot is sore. So now they're trying to load on their whole body on 50% two hooves instead of three. So they're not a tripod anymore. Um, but if you give them that support, they can find the alignment, the organization that allows them to stand on that other leg while you're working. And you can flip it over and try the other side. I think the majority of horses like the hard side. Um, as opposed to the medium, but you know, you have the two different surfaces specifically to give the horses that choice. And so, you know, um, Brynja had the pad in 2017, because that's when we came out with the first ones. They were pink and brown, the very original ones. Daisy got one of the pinks. That was a that's a 2017 pad. And I left Germany and Brynja sent me photos. So there was a horse at her barn that was down and absolutely refused to get up. And her horse, Ernie, actually came over and helped and helped get that horse up. And when they got it up, they put it on the full physio pad. And within minutes, it was eating grass. Um, and she sent me pictures. It was like a miracle. Um, and I've had a number of people tell me stories about how there was a horse colicking and they use the physio pad. Now, if you have any pad, I would say use it, but of course the lower profile makes things a little bit easier. Um, but we've had so many horses now where the horse is colicking and they use the physio pad and the horse stopped. So you always call your vet and then you grab your pad, okay? You get your vet on the way, you'd much rather call them up and say, sorry, I don't need you, then I should have called them sooner. Um, so while they're on the way, you can do the T touches on the ears, the belly lifts, and you can stand them on a sure foot pad. And um, just like I said, we have a number of people now. Um, oh, somebody just told me. A, oh yeah, um, in Sinead's webinar that I did with Sinead a couple of weeks ago, McCann from Australia, she was saying how her horse really was not interested in sure foot. And then he colicked and she used the pads and he got so much better. And ever since then he knickers at the pads and he's happy to see her with them. Um, and he's had a total change of heart. Um, so, you know, it's, it's another tool in your kit. It's lightweight, portable, a half physio pad. You can put on your airplane seat if you're flying anymore. Um, you can pack it in your bag. Um, I would not leave home without a ha at least a half physio pad in my kit when I would leave home anymore, never. Um, you, we've had people stand on it. I've had people that have had um, head injuries and headaches. I put them on the pad and in minutes, their headache's gone. I cannot explain that. Um, but we know it to be true. We have enough evidence now from experience that uh, that that pad, and you can stand on all the surefoot pads, by the way. Um, they can help you with your balance too. So, um, but, so that's why we have the lineup that we have. And, you know, every time we think, oh, this is too many choices. People, you know, don't know which to pick. What are we going to take out of it? Mm, we, we can't make that decision. So we don't. Um, it does make it a little harder for you. We are working on some more quizzes to help you if you have gotten one pair of pads, what you would choose next. I'm hoping to have that kind of wrapped up this week. 
Um, the quiz has been really helpful. I can tell because I see how many people are taking it to make a decision of what the first pad is that they should buy. Um, and there's a quiz on both the Murdoch Method uh, website under the Surefoot tab and on the Shop Surefoot site where it says quiz and it's in five different languages on Shop Surefoot. French, English, um, Spanish, uh, German and Dutch. Um, and it's just to help you make that decision of what is the first pair of pads that would be best for your horse. Um, you know, that's been one of the most common questions people ask me. And I understand, you know, it's like this new weird thing. And what do I do? And how do I choose? Because there's so many choices. And, um, you know, I've had marketing people tell me, well, you just tell them do this pad for five weeks and then you get the next one. It's like, that doesn't work. That's not what the horse wants. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, that if that's the, the biggest problem that we have, so be it, right? But, um, because there's so many choices, sometimes it's hard to choose. Uh, but um, that's where the fans of Surefoot page is so fantastic. So if you're not a member, um, please go and join. Um, the community is great. It's building all the time and people are so helpful and answer questions. And I, I did put up this whole um, post about wear and tear because I, I, it seems like springtime is when I get the most questions about wear and tear. I don't know why, maybe people start using their pads more. Um, they're very durable. We have pads that from the original set that we ever sold, I can tell because all the tops were yellow colored in the very first run, long story, talked about that in another webinar. Um, so I know they're still out there. I know they're still working. Now you can wear them out, especially the firm. You use it enough, you can wear it out. It just doesn't return to its original shape anymore. It just gets tired. Uh, but um, you know they're gonna get nicks and tears and cuts. They're not gonna look pretty anymore. And unfortunately, I think there's a misconception that foam should stand up to a horse regardless. But you have to realize that we went through this process of coming up with something that was durable and yet would give us the results because I can make them so that they will last forever, but they will not work. And so this is the trade-off. Um, and so that's where the materials that we're using are very durable. Are they going to look as pretty as you took them out of the wrapper? No, but nothing around your horse does. Right. So my example is you get a brand new blanket. I did this this winter. I got a brand new blanket for the one horse I was riding. I had to clip him because he was sweating so much. And in our environment, it was, you know, better to clip and gave him a trace clip. Got him this brand new blanket fit beautifully. I turned him out. What's the first thing they do? They roll. What's the second thing? They play tag with each other and they grab the blanket and they wrestle it. And by the end of the year, it's filthy and dirty and has rips and tears and it's still keeping them dry. It just doesn't look like brand new out of the pack. And that's the same thing with Surefoot pads. They will get nicks and tears and cuts. The pair I put up in that post on fans page, they were being used with six horses for a couple years, like, like four days a week. Um, and they are beat up and banged and they were still doing their job. So they're just not gonna look like brand new. Now the manufacturer's warranty covers um, things like if the layers come unglued, that's a manufacturing defect. We cover that. Um, if they break in half, which has never happened, uh, we cover that. Um, sometimes the surface might bubble. So if the glue wasn't perfectly, completely uniform, the surface might bubble. Now, if you are at altitude, um, which this is really fun when the first set of pads um, I first thing I did was go to Colorado and I had them on the table and the first day there were little tiny bubbles and then the second day they were growing and they were moving. <laughs> it was like there are amoebas underneath the surface and what it was was there was little tiny air bubbles in in the glue that laminated the surface and in altitude that air expanded and it created a bigger bubble. Now, I just simply popped it with a pin, let the air out, the surface went back down and all was well. Um, and that can occasionally happen, although much less so, we seem to have resolved that problem. But um, I could show you a picture. It was the funniest thing because I just thought that the pads you know, were possessed for a while. Um, and, uh, but what it was is, um, 
Oops, that's not the best picture. Those are kind of fuzzy. Oh, there we go. Um, let me just get over a screen share. Oops, only I can't do that. Hang on, I can do it. Screen share. Do, do, do. There they are. Okay, and this is actually um, in Colorado, um, Rhonda. So, so these bubbles started out tiny, and this was um, this is a pair of firm pads. The very first run, they were all yellow topped. So I can tell it's firm because it's the two inches all the way around. But these bubbles just they kept expanding, um, and it was just okay. So here you can see what I did was I just stuck a pin in it. And when I stuck the pin in it deflated and it went, that's delamination. If you want to know what delamination looks like, that's what delamination looks like when the layers come apart. Here's more bubbles. Um, oh, and here's more bubbles. Now, uh, this is a firm pad with bubbles. Um, please, please do not leave your pads in a, an enclosed hot car or an enclosed trailer. Um, it can get really high temperatures. So, the, the rule of thumb is if you would not leave your dog in that car or that trailer, do not leave your pads in there um, because the, the temperatures can get really, really high. And so um, that was one time I actually, this was early on, I left a pair of pads in their shrink wrap in a clear vinyl plastic bag in the sun and they were not happy. Um, but you know we have pads, lots and lots of pads in Australia where it gets really, really hot, um, and they're fine as long as you don't leave them like in a car where the temperatures can get I don't know crazy high, um, or a, or a horse trailer that's totally closed up. Same thing. Um, you know it's just basic um, general care. You, you know if you take care of your pads, they'll take care of you. Soap and water is how you clean them. Um, you know, we, I do not recommend that you let horses bite them. <laughs> they are not covered for, for bites. Um, but, you know, they will give you years and years of use. And just think about, you know, that you cannot buy the kind of comfort that Surefoot Pads give your horse uh, the, way, the way that they do. And so this is a tool. It's a tool in your kit. The goal is, is getting your horse ready to ride, having a nice relaxed horse or helping them recover from something. So if you think of Surefoot as your tools to success, then you will do just fine. Um, and we have managed to come to the end of another hour. So if anybody has any questions, happy to answer that. Um, yes. uh, uh, the measurement of the full physio is 24 by 16 by an inch and a half. The half physio is 16 by 12, so it's half the size, uh, 16 by 12 by an inch and a half. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here next week with some more exciting webinars with Wendy, and so stay tuned. Bye-bye.